is advised. Okay, so I don't know if anyone outside of California listening, because we got listeners from around the world. Um, Skid Row, if you Google it, is probably the derelict area in Los Angeles, California. It's 54 blocks long. Skid Row has been around since the early 40s in some parts. It's, Man. It's, it primarily started after the Great Depression. And it's in the downtown area of Los Angeles to where people just don't have any place to live. And over the years, as things progressed with drugs and alcohol issues, it used to just be people either down their luck or alcoholics. And then it turned into homeless, then it turned into drug addicts. And then the also unfortunate situation, a lot of people with mental health issues are down there as well. Mm-hmm. And it's always been a crime infested area. Um, and Skid Row at, at one point, um, it, it has had anywhere it varies because it's hard to keep track of everybody. But it can vary from anywhere from 6,000 to 8,000 to one one year, 10,000 people homeless in 54 square blocks, you know, living in tent cities. <sighs> and um, it's very, very, very depressing if you're ever in the Los Angeles area to go down there. Oh, yeah. Uh, the demographics for this area uh, <clears throat> in 2019, the population was about 5,000 that they counted. And it was 11% increase over the last two years. And it was um, 7% were under the age of 18. Uh, 1% was 18 to 24. 60% of them were 25 to 54 years old. Mm. 19% 55 to 61 years old. And 10% 62 years and older. And veterans, war veterans made up almost 10% of the population. Mm. So that that hits home. Uh, 12%. 12% were white, 58% black or African American, 2% Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, 24%. Um, which, really? Yeah, which is pretty high. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Asian, 0.63. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. That sounds oh. more like it. Yeah, yeah my bad. Yeah. Hispanic was 24.53. Really? Okay, that, that makes sense. So that it, it gives you a diverse, um, uh, what do you call it? description now this part doesn't make any sense the per capita income uh was uh between fourteen thousand that they made per year i'm guessing if you're on skid row you don't have that much so i don't know where they came up with that um Mm. but that's a basic breakdown of skid row a lot of crime a lot of homelessness so this story will take take us back a little bit um it will be in between the years of the 1960s and 70s oh man yeah So this story is about the crimes on the less fortunate and also being not the sexiest for the media at the time to report on and even know or even now they won't give priority. Um, After our little story lesson uh, that I just brought up, uh, giving you an outlook on Skid Row, let's uh, see how the story actually starts and who we're actually talking about here, because this is going to be kind of a complex story that a lot of people haven't heard too much about. And our subject for tonight is Vaughn Greenwood. Vaughn Greenwood. Vaughn Greenwood. He was born January 1st, 1944 in a small town in Pennsylvania. Okay. The town is not known for, uh, exact town is not known to this day because his background is unlike most serial killers. Like when Gabby brought up Jeffrey Dahmer, when I brought up uh, the Golden State Killer, we knew just about everything about how he was raised, where he grew up, his family life. This guy's background is not really known too much. And I believe there's a good reason for it. It's, okay. just, it's just they don't bring it up and they don't want to bring it up. So, and, I'll, and, and you'll, you'll get it as we go along. Um, so his public records aren't exactly divulged still to this day. Um, here's what we do know about his past we do we do know that he was given up for adoption at an unknown early age between two to five years old dang he was in many foster homes and he completed just up until the seventh grade before quitting um his eighth grade year of school dang um he just quit school one day in the eighth grade at in the year 1956 and ran away from his foster home so what do you think he did a small kid or a, not a small kid he's 
eighth grade in 1956, what do you think he did? Go west. He went west to California. You guys are correct because I, I mentioned, yes, sir. I, I mentioned <laughs> Los Angeles, but <laughs> you know, I figured he'd go west. I figured so. <laughs> Well, you guys are right. He went on a very big adventure. He hitchhiked his way all the way to California, which took him two weeks. So that's not bad for a kid his age. Um, not bad at all. But the thing is, and the thing is that he encountered, which he didn't bring up too much details. All we know that he did some things that he's not, he wasn't proud of to get here. <clears throat> so there's some stuff that's left out that we will never know about. Um, so there's no record for him from an age gap of eight years. So from the ages of 12 to 20, he's like off the radar. Like he doesn't exist. Dang. So he never tells this, this story to the authorities or anybody else. Nobody knows this story. Nobody knows <clears throat> what he was doing for those eight years. Um, we do know that at some point, in that time period, in the early 60s, he identifies as a gay or homosexual black man, which must have been extremely hard at the time uh, period because being black was, you were marked already in the, mm -hmm. that's, that, that's the freaking hardest time in America with the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And then being gay at the same time, I mean... It was hard enough being gay in the 80s and early 90s. Imagine in the 60s and being black. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't, gays weren't as, as accepting as it is today back then. Yes. Now, if he, if we talked about in the other show, if he came out, you know, today and said, hey, I'm gay, everyone would clap or they'd be like, okay. And if he came out and said, hey, I'm gay, they would probably lynch him, unfortunately. You know what I mean? That's yeah. how, how bad it was. Um, so it's speculated he was engaging in sex acts to survive and he really didn't have a job um, until 1964 when he was working of all things in the fields of San Bernardino as a migrant worker uh, picking crops oh yeah. he was close to he was close to home for me now he's right around the corner from you uh oh <laughs> so let's let's talk murder um, uh oh so on November 13th 1964 because what happens when i mention a date somebody getting clipped <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly on the famous footsteps of what do you think in los angeles what, what famous monument in los angeles if you guys city get this, hall. no not city hall but that's close uh, ah it's close to city hall huh? uh ooh. i don't know Okay, uh, the city library. You know the famous oh, L.A. city library? Yeah. That's close to the Skid Row. That's like, you know, only a couple... That's over there in downtown, too. Uh-huh. Um, the body of David Russell, age not known, was discovered in the morning by city workers. How was, how was the homeless body found, you say? Because David Russell was a homeless man at that time. What do you, how do you, how was it found? How, yeah, was how, it, uh, how was the body found? I'm going to say his neck was slashed. Okay. I'm going to say there's body parts on on um, on each of the steps. <laughs> no, but uh, I, th I think Matt got closest. Um, he, David's body had stab wounds on his throat, so his throat was slashed. He's correct. But he had deep knife wounds in his head, chest, and lower abdomen. He was stabbed over 70 times. Damn. Good God. His throat was slashed from ear to ear. Good God. And that's not the worst part of it. The Let me guess. He was cut in his butt. No. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> no, what happened is um, the police were shocked to see that, of all things, salt was spread around his body. Like, and not the, not the, like, you know, the little salt, the, the, the real, you know, like the restaurant salt you put on pretzels? Yeah, iodized salt. Yeah, I died. There you go. I died. Thick salt was all around his body, sort of like a ritual. And um, his shoes were taken off, and there it was like they were pointing to his his head, like they on one side of each uh, you know each side of his head. They were like the what shoes. The? 
Yeah. And two small paper cups were filled with the victim's blood next to the body. Body. Yo, this man is sick. Yes. Um, First of all, hold on. Talk about, I, 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 interesting question. Uh -huh. I know they're homeless and all, mm -hmm. but who has the time and energy to do all that? And who does not get caught doing all that? I know you're on Skid Row, but somebody should have seen that. Well, I mean... Was this at night? Yes, this was he, night. He, was, he just planned it out. He's probably been thinking about doing something like this for a long time. And he just he had a plan. He Man. And, and whatever plan it was, it baffled the police. But however, as outrageous as that murder was, because we at the same time, you know, or just a few years later, or at the same time, or the few years later, the Manson, I'm, I forget when the Mansons were around. They uh, did some pretty. 60s, early 70s. They did some shocking things, but because it was it was white and in a rich area, the cops paid attention. Mm -hmm. This the is rifles. <clears throat> and yeah, the artillery they were using. Because this man, I believe, was an African American, and he was in, in a homeless, you know, on the footsteps of the city library. Not really a big deal. Is as, as atrocious as the murder was, this didn't get no pub. I mean, we still don't. We still don't know the man's name. That's jacked up. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't know the man's name. They was um, like Johnson. Just, uh, just sprinkle some crack on him and let's go. <laughs> They're all like, "Well, Johnson, he's already been sprinkled salt." You know? Listen, <laughs> good point. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like they already did our job. Um, the police immediately thought they had a satanic ritual or a cult killing. Yeah. Mm. So, despite all this stuff, um, there was. You know, and and that happened, and outrageously, you know, the the shocking the shockness of it. This didn't slow Vaughn down. He didn't he didn't even wait one day. Like less than twenty four hours later, barely turning November fourteenth, nineteen sixty four, the body of a sixty seven year old uh, Benjamin Hornberg in the bathroom of a dingy motel was discovered on Skid Row. Wow. The transient had mustered up enough money to get a room for the night. So the poor guy had panhandled enough just to get a room and he's wound up, he wound up, uh, is murdered in his own room. Um, that the morning housekeeper came by and, and uh, discovered the body <clears throat> and the body was in the bathtub with stab wounds all over the head again and the chest. And again, the deep throat slashing from ear to ear. Whoa. So at this time, detectives remembered yesterday's case, knew that they knew that they probably had a serial killer. But did they sound the alarm? I don't think so. Not whatsoever. They did not. <laughs> they did not even alert the media. Wow. <clears throat> so um, especially when they found the shoes pointing to the bathtub in a, in a weird way and a cup of uh, blood where the uh, soap was. See? So it was pretty much the same thing, just different locations, obviously. Yep. Yep. Wow. <clears throat> so then a, a, a very quick twist. Uh oh, you know, I love them twists. Oh, yeah. You love the twists. Um, as quickly as the murder started, they stopped. They stopped. Um, Vaughn would leave the Los Angeles area the next day. He would hitchhike and ride trains and, and wound up in Chicago working in a uh, some sort of factory for about a year to two years. Mm -hmm. And two years later, in 1966, Bond would be in a relationship with a man who was 48 years older than him. So in his what? Yeah, he was in his 60s or, or, or close to his 70s. Um, he one day snapped at the older man when he tried to get some money off of him. The man said no. Bond slashed his throat just out of nowhere just slashed his throat um wow but the guy didn't die the 70 year old mm -hmm. uh was able to get to the police while holding his uh, neck and he was able to identify vaughn and vaughn was charged and arrested for the attempted murder mm. so slashing a man's throat how many years do you think vaughn got 20 I would hope he got 20, but knowing that the history of our cases with dumb polices, I'm going to say he got three years. No, no. Actually, you know, I have to give the James on this one. He got 20 years. 
Oh, wow. But he served eight. <laughs> oh. Good behavior. Yeah, good behavior for that throat slasher. Good guy. <laughs> wow. See, the way he was doing the murders with the cups and putting everything in place. Yeah. He must have been really good in jail that, oh, yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did such a great job putting everything in order and nice and neat. You know, besides a little OCD with the way he folds <laughs> his uniform. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um,. This is where he returns to Los Angeles in 1974. So just released in Chicago, he's like heading west. Um, he goes back to his old tricks. So Skid Row. Yeah, just in time for the holiday season, December 1st, he murders a 46-year-old alcoholic on Skid Row. So this dude is just drinking, having a, you know probably scrounged up enough money to buy a bottle of you know rum or vodka or something, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe even a few beers. And um, guess where he kills this guy? In broad daylight, right there in the opening. No. Wow. At, at, it's at night. But... Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, skid Row. Skid Row. I'm thinking of Skid Row. I'm going to say by the... I'm by City by, Hall this time. Yeah, I'm going to say by City Hall. City Hall? Wrong again, guys. <laughs> but, but you know what? I would have given you major props had you got it. He killed him in the exact same spot he killed the dude years prior. On Are the, you serious? On the, the porch library. steps of the library. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What is it about that steps? I don't know. Maybe he had some, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, he owed money for non-returned books or something and pissed him off. But He is so prompt and exact. Of where Man. He yes. And so <clears throat> the police, when they came to investigate, they, there was no cups in the blood this time. But the throat was slashed from ear to ear, and some cops were like, nah, this can't be the same. He's literally on the same step as he killed the dude years prior. So you wow. You wonder if that's the same detectives. That's all I was about to say. I wonder like, if it's the same years, detective after years eight years. Before that. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Now, I have a question. Okay. I don't know if it mentions it, but you mentioned earlier that he was homosexual. Did it show any signs of sexual... Uh, abuse on these men that were slash police back then were not open to be looking for that kind of thing on another man wow Makes sense. if it was a woman they would be like hey let's check her to see if she was raped yep they're not going to check a man's back door they're just not <laughs> especially back then they're like i've never seen mine myself how am i supposed to see that man's you know what <laughs> i mean so it's just not going to happen got you got you that's the mentality back then. So, okay. So just two blocks away from that on Sixth Street. So you guys might know where that's at. That's a yes, I do. Yeah. So, in an alley, a 47-year-old homeless man was found with his throat slashed and his shoes off, pointing to him. This guy was a uh, Russian immigrant, Moses Yakantchevich. Um, was found Good job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was found a day though after he was murdered so he was like behind a dumpster so his body was left uh, not in the open wow so that's four already that's four and one attempt yep so again no connection by the police to any other murder at this point with this new guy then three days later on December 11th found in an abandoned building a body of a 54 year old Arthur Da Slet was found with his neck slashed almost to the point of his head being decapitated. Oh, wow. Jesus Christ. Yes. Again, no tie to any of the other murders. Not alerted the media. We just move on. Um, then December 22nd, so 11 days later, David Perez, 42 years old, homeless, was found in the bushes just outside the library. Wow. Something about that library. Yeah. He must have been sleeping down there or something. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't... Um, again, his throat was slashed. At this point, there was no extra police patrolling the area. No undercover task force. No media coverage. No coverage at all. Wow. Yeah. That's the... That's, it's as if they just... All right. They just don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. So... He takes a break for, uh, you know, New Year's, you know, Christmas, you know, celebrates somehow. Um, so January 9th, 1975, a 58-year-old Kazimir Stralnowski was found dead on the hotel, uh, on his hotel bed 
hands folded, laying on his uh, back, throat slashed. So there's another one. Wow. Then just eight days later, 46-year-old Robert Shanahan was found seven days later in his hotel by his housekeeper or housekeeping. Seven days later? Yeah. And this is where this is what I question, guys. You guys have been to hotels and motels, stayed the night, whatever, right? Absolutely. When you put a do not disturb sticker on your door, they don't listen. Housekeeping. No. They yeah. still knock. And they still come in and change your sheets even when you tell them not to. <laughs> Seven days. Seven dude. days? That's some lazy housekeeping. Man. Yeah. <sighs> well, um, he was um, he was also found with a bayonet. You know what a bayonet is, right? Yes, I do know what a bayonet. At the end of those old timey war guns. Yes, sir. That was sticking out his chest. Oh wow! Good God! Yes, that was still in his chest when they found him. <clears throat> um, then two days later, a forty-nine-year-old Samuel Suarez was found murdered in his fifth room hotel room. And keep in mind, all these killings are in the Skid Row area. No connection. So you have a a Skid Row area, which is technically now 54 blocks, but back then it was a little smaller. Mm -hmm. And you've had multiple deaths and just nothing. They're not putting any of this together. Wow. So fast forward to January 29th. George Frias was murdered in his own home. Now here's where it changes. In his own home? In his own home. Oh, man. George Frias lived just outside of of Skid Row, a few miles away in West Hollywood. Oh. And West Hollywood is is known known for... for, You know it. Yes. And for all those... Homosexualities. Yeah, you have a a big homosexual... um, uh, What is it? uh, Community. Community in the area, which even back then was taboo yeah. but they still live their life and you know if that's what they want that's what they want I mean, we're not here to judge or nothing but back then it was taboo and but yeah. they still you know and and there, here's where the sex i think they this is why this story isn't that big because back then they didn't want to promote this like you can be killing blonde white women or other women as a you know as a sexual predator doing cult things for some reason that was sexy to the media they didn't want to report on a homeless person number one and number two a homosexual those didn't matter to them yeah even though these were atrocities and these were poor people losing their lives and it sucked they refused to to report on it now at this time mr von greenwood looked like a linebacker for the pittsburgh steelers he had a very healthy <laughs> he had a very healthy uh fro 1970s uh, 60s fro um, he was built like a linebacker. He was uh, six feet. I forget how many pounds. He was a big, stunning-looking dude. He looked like a bouncer. So mm. in the gay community, that's very attractive. So he mm. went, he went home with this man, and I guess something was said, or he snapped, and that was it. Wow. But they would not say it was a homosexual murder or that it was it had to do with, with sex. They just said a man entered a man's home and killed him. So... But the police um, saw that there was no forced entry, so they were thinking he's a friend, not a lover. Mm -hmm. But still, Mm -hmm. you know, this caught their attention because this guy was not, George Frias was a regular community person. No one knew he was gay, but that's still, you know, it's it's happening now outside of Skid Row, so the cops are taking note. Um. At this, uh, you know, at this point, the cops were thinking that it might be a sexual predator uh, or sexual uh, w- worker that was behind it. But the vo- but the people, as as I just described Vaughn to you guys, the people and the witnesses were describing him as a white male. A and, white male? Yeah, they were saying that there was just no black people in the neighborhood, so it couldn't have been a black guy. It had to be a yeah. white guy. Yeah. So the cops were looking for a white guy. And that was Vaughn, that was music to his ears. Yeah, Vaughn was a big, buff, dark black man, so that <laughs> didn't fit the description. <laughs> he literally walked by all the detectives. Morning. morning. <laughs> yeah, they're all keep, keep on walking, sir. 
Keep on walking, sir. We're not looking for you. <laughs> We're looking for a white man. Have you seen this white man? <laughs> for once. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. He probably passed out. He's like, no way. <laughs> um, I'm getting away with this. Yeah. And uh, so oh. just two days later, January 31st, 1975, Vaughn killed his uh, youngest victim, 34-year-old Clyde Hayes, who was a mechanic in the West Hollywood area, was found in the in his own garage, stabbed in the face and throat, and his um, his throat slashed and his body mutilated. Um, what? But not much else is described other than the the cups of blood was also found on the scene. And um, so again, this was in West Hollywood, or West Los Angeles, and the cops now believe that this one was a rendezvous of some sort, and. Uh, something happened sexually and the, the man was stabbed again so finally the police are starting to put the the uh the stuff that was happening in skid row together with this and <clears throat> yeah and so um the police began ramping up their their coverage for the first time in this whole thing and they were figuring out that this wasn't just a random uh, you know a perpetrator this is someone that's been doing this for a while so that didn't stop Vaughn. The very next day, Vaughn broke into a house of William Grant and, and his quote-unquote roommate. Vaughn attacked both men and uh, with a hatchet. He cut he cut him up a couple times or stabbed them with a hatchet. Hey. And before having, I guess, the hatchet broke the second time he hit the, the, uh, the lover, and he just got tired of him, and he threw both of them outside the sliding glass door so that shows you his power he just yeah he just threw him through like you know how jazzy jeff on fresh prince yeah. goes out the door. Oh. <laughs> yeah it was like that i was like ah out the door Dang, man. yeah so um at this point being in west hollywood a lot of rich neighborhoods um the commotion woke up the neighbors they called the police and the hollywood um and in hollywood all you have to say is there's a black attacker in a white neighborhood and the police were on their way in seconds in mm -hmm. seconds what <laughs> so here's where our story takes a dramatic twist here we go i love the twist yes so we're gonna listen now to a five minute clip it's exactly five minute clips this is burt reynolds the uh movie star and this is his encounter with the skid row slasher on the diana uh dinosaur so back in the early 80s he tells of a, of how he met the Skid Row Slasher. We were together and, and I, as usual, either didn't come home or did come home or whatever. And on this particular night, I don't know why, I came home at about three in the morning. And there was a man called, I'm gonna, I'm gonna condense this story real fast. There's a man called the Skid Row Slasher oh. who had killed. Oh, I forgot. Uh, they think about 23 people. You know, cut them and, and he had given some drugs down below my house, and they said, "You know who lives up there?" And for I'm some reason, thought that was happening. He went up and waited in my closet for me, but I didn't come home. So he got bored waiting in the closet, and he went up to the house above me and. Killed one guy and cut the other guy real bad. I oh. slid down the hill and then I came home. It was then three o'clock in the morning. And you remember I used to leave the doors wide open. Oh, yeah. And I never had a weapon in the no. house. And I went in and I was lying down and crawling on the floor was one of the guys from, from the house above. With his stomach wide open. He was holding his inside. And I looked down and he couldn't talk and I jumped up and there wasn't 911 in those days, but whatever the equivalent was. And I looked out the door, and standing about 15 feet from me was a skid row slasher with a machete, a Clint Eastwood hat, and a Serapi. Right. He's staring at me. I'm staring at him, he's staring at me. I closed the door, and then I looked for a weapon. You know, I tried a knife, a bottle, or whatever. And he slowly, it was a great act acting lesson, because he slowly walked across in this fish. Helicopters came and cops came and oh, I know that. what they found out was the reason they knew it was him was because every time he had murdered somebody he had taken his shoes, which only these two cops, played by Walter Matthau and Peter Falk, <laughs> uh, they took their shoes and pointed them at the head. And only they knew that, the press didn't know about it. 
So they said it's a schedule slash year. And can, did you see him? I said, yeah, I, I looked right in his eye. There he is. So then I went down to do WW and Dixie Dance mm. They called me and said, we got him. Because when he slid down the hill, his food stamps came out. And we tracked him to his address. And will you come and identify him? I said, yeah. I come back, I fly me in, they bring me down the bottom, of the, and, and I must say, nobody knew about this, I was in the basement. I come up and I'm standing back there, I'm standing with some cop who, who was a very nice guy, and he said, when you walk out, look right at him. Don't be intimidated. I said, I'm not going to be intimidated. He said, look right at him. I said, I'm not worried about it. So I came out, and I looked right at him, and he looked like mm. O.J. Simpson would read for it and be too much of a fairy. <laughs> this guy was, I mean, his neck was big, and, his, and he lifted weights. He'd been in prison about 23 years of his life, and he did nothing but lift weights. So I sat down in the chair, and I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me, and he's smiling. So I smile back at him, and the public defender gets up, and he says, do you know who this is? And I said, you how do you know who this is? So because I saw him, and he had my clothes on. He said, what do you mean your clothes? I said, well, that was my Serapi that Clint Eastwood gave me, from the good that I had me. That's right. And I said, I recognize it, and I said, there's a clean slip inside, if you look. I never could figure out why they did this. Instead of Reynolds, it says R-E-Y-O. And the guys blanched, and they, they took it up, and the judge said, hmm. So then he said, well, you're an actor, aren't you? And I said, well, the jury's still out about that. <laughs> <laughs> I got a very nice laugh. And, and the judge said, this is not the Tonight Show, Mr. Reynolds. Just answer the question. I said, yes. And, and so we went back and forth, and he had my identification person. So it was very short, but I, I had nailed it. Significant. As I got up, as I'm walking by him, I look, and as he's looking at me, he's writing. But he's not looking down, he's looking at me and writing. And as I came behind him, I looked over his shoulder, and he said, probably about 125 times, Gilbert Reynolds, Gilbert Reynolds, Gilbert Reynolds. But they, they put him away forever and ever, ever, oh, ever, ever, ever. Why ever. Do you ask this for him? They will know. I know when this guy, you know, plucks his eyebrows. But the story, is, the end of the story is, if I hadn't been with you, okay. I would have come home probably at nine. See? And he would have been there, and uh, I'd have my shoes pointed at me right okay. now. Um, and they said the best movie he ever did was um, Wild One. <laughs> well, you yeah. So that was Burt Reynolds. Wow. Wow. And had, so he encountered the actual man himself. Man. Yeah. Um, so we would have maybe lost him had he been there a little earlier. And you, for real, describing the guy coming down with his guts hanging out. I mean, sort That's, of, yeah. Like, like Forrest Gump when what's his name was, um, his, his guts oh, were. Right. Yeah. That's jacked up. <laughs> no, but that's, that's what, that's what it probably looked like. His intestine. Yeah, probably. Dang, dude, that's the man. That's pretty trippy, right? Yeah. So um, after he, Burt Reynolds describes what, you know, he identifying him and all this other stuff, um, he was convicted on nine counts or nine of the 11. Now, Burt Reynolds says he killed like 23. Yeah. He did not kill 23. But um, he was. I mean, maybe they could try to maybe link some to him, but as far as I know, he only killed 11, which is a lot. Um, but yeah, yeah. what do you think happened to him after he was convicted of the, the victims? Um, you said this story has a twist. I don't know if it was another twist. No, so no. I'm going to say, that was oh, that's it. Oh. Um, I'm going to say he got the death penalty. Same. Same. You would be both wrong. Whoa! He did not get the death penalty. He is currently a year younger than my dad right now. He's seventy six. Yeah. yeah, he's he's Three. he's still alive, but he's here in California at the California Men's uh, Jail in San Quentin. Oh, so he's locked away for life. But uh, a guy who later would you know, and he's been super duper quiet. They have tried to interview him. They've tried. The media has tried to interview him. He does not talk. He just won't talk. Only in passing did he let a fellow prisoner know at one point that he did drink some of the blood 
of what one, of one of the victims yes uh, so that is all we know he hasn't said anything else he hasn't said nothing the guy has been mute since 1977 jesus yes so um yeah 11 murdered and one survivor out of the whole mess that is von greenwood the skid row slasher wow <laughs> yeah I learned very that. interesting story man very interesting story that's I close to that, home actually. Yeah. i learned how the media coverage has changed over the years mm -hmm. the police coverage on victims mm -hmm. as you refer to and the way we look at people in society and how as in burt reynolds case mm -hmm. you never know and you have to be prepared and sometimes you're lucky absolutely but it also goes to show you how dangerous that place could be it's good road yeah and that could be in any decade any day because yeah. you never know people's mentality mm -hmm. and it started when he was given up at five mm -hmm. with the adoption so um, it just starts from there if you don't have the parents if you don't have the guardians you're you're messed up mentally absolutely yeah and it just goes in uh it goes in any time frame any decade mm -hmm. you're you're just messed up and you have a story like this and the again another thing that shocked me was the uh the detail on all the crimes with yes. the shoot mm -hmm. the cups mm -hmm. uh slashing <laughs> slap where the slashings were he enjoyed what he did i i'm, I'm just blown away by the uh the uh the Brut slickness and the, the brutality the, yeah just just everything was the same mm -hmm. every time pretty much except the yeah the uh the bayonet yeah so mm -hmm. that that was great what, what you think yeah i mean yeah i mean I, I i just think like kind of to piggyback on what uh big game james said is it really depends on who the victims are because let's be real man like you mentioned uh the one that was in west hollywood he kind of got the media's attention because of his ethnicity and mm -hmm. being that it was skid row i've been down skid row i'm quite sure you've been down skid row james i don't know if you've been but it's bad and be real you probably would forget about those people if someone you know you well he probably just had a fight with someone and it don't matter he didn't have family it really shows how the media looks at status, man, and see where you are in life to even care. Because, dude, he murdered about, what, eight people before the media even said, okay, we're dealing with the same person. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it's just, it, it, it's, it sucks. I understand it. I kind of get it. You know what I'm saying? But it still sucks. And yeah i i agree it's just the fact that you know like like this case doesn't get much media coverage to this day and yeah. like we we don't know like a lot of people don't know the skid row slasher um never heard of it until today never. yeah on this page i brought it up on many other facebook forums and stuff like that and a lot of people didn't know and you know let's just say for instance burt reynolds was murdered that night this would be he would we be would one know. yeah you would know this would be one of you would definitely know one of California's worst serial killers because he took out Burt Reynolds in his prime. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But uh, but you don't know him because it didn't happen. It just you know, it was a, yeah. like like James said, it was a coincidence or like a, a a fateful moment that he just happened not to be there at that time. And when he's yeah. right, when he's writing, I mean, how that would freak out Burt Reynolds probably till he died. Uh, the fact that he saw the dude writing, "I got to kill Burt Reynolds. I got to kill Burt Reynolds." That's <laughs> alarming. <laughs> By the way, good good piece in actually playing the the interview with uh, Burt Reynolds. Oh, thank you, thank you. Did a little yeah. research on that. So pretty good. That was the first time we've done that. Pretty good. Yes, sir. So yeah. that that's our show for today. That was the Skid Row Slasher. Yes, sir. I feel like he should have gotten deaf mm -hmm. because yep. it doesn't matter who the victims were. What he did was very heinous and he knew what he was doing and he didn't care what he was doing 
And despite them being in that condition, despite them probably not having family or having mental issues, mental issue, they were still human beings and they didn't deserve to be murdered like that. So he should have gotten death penalty, but at least he's tucked away for life in San Quentin and he won't be hurting anybody and talking to anybody for the rest of his life. Let me add on just a couple of things. With um, with the way society was back then, they didn't care about if you had mental health if problems or mm-hmm. whatnot. They didn't mm-hmm. care about your past. If you killed someone, you killed someone and it was instant you know, death penalty mm-hmm. or life in yeah. mm-hmm. So much different now. Absolutely. If you're crazy mentally, like they say, you know, you get a pass. Yeah, there's insanity, please. Right. Now, back then, that wasn't the case. And I was really shocked to hear uh, the verdict and, you mm-hmm. know, where he is now, where he should be. Yeah, he didn't get the death penalty. <laughs> where he... I mean, if you think crazy. if you think about it, Manson, and I bring back Manson oh, again yeah. because... Manson got the death penalty, but he didn't, you know, he didn't wind up serving it because, you know, California is California. That's a whole nother story. Yep. But he got the death penalty and he didn't actually commit a murder. Now he told people to commit murder, but he didn't commit a murder. He it's never fit. Difference. Yeah, big difference. <laughs> mm-hmm. he, got, he got the death penalty, wound up on death row. But this guy got like, you know, forever and a day, um, but he's still breathing. You know, yeah. I, I I think that's an atrocity um, in itself. Uh, but yeah. some people are pro death penalty, some aren't. I just think when there's when there's overwhelming DNA, when there's overwhelming, um, you know, there's no turning back. You know, this is a dude a hundred percent. The death the death penalty should come into play. Um, I agree. But if there's a chance a dude is, you know, well, that's why they have appeals processes too, I guess. But you know, yeah. I think if the death penalty was back in its full form like it was back in the day Mm -hmm. you know they'll chop your head off with the guillotine i think if that was still in effect crime it wouldn't be eradicated but it would definitely be less yeah because the electric chair scared the crap out of people yeah you know Mm -hmm. so they they ran that in texas to what the 60s or 70s Mm -hmm. So, so i mean that freaked a lot of people and then over there in texas i mean they don't play i mean you you usually spend about three to 10 years on death row and you're done, you're cooked. So yep. they don't, they don't mess around here in, you know, Los Angeles. We've, we've talked about a couple or California, a couple um, uh, people like we did the Stainer brothers, uh, you know, Carrie Stainer with all those murders, he got the death penalty. He's still sitting on death penalty or death row. So, um, you know, when we did um, what's his name um, the uh, night stalker, he died on death row. You know, he did. He wasn't murdered. You know, he he wasn't taken out on death row. He just died of, you know, cancer. I think it was or something. Like yeah. That. But, <sighs> I guess it's just wow. the rot. Yeah. But that's our story. 